All right, welcome everyone. Um, so um, we are here um, to, oh, I hope you guys are all here for the University of Southern um, Indiana, um, Pat College of Science and Engineering and Education. So I hope this is uh, where everyone's wanting to be. Um, so I'm the facilitator, so I will just kind of pop in um, in the beginning and then at the end, just kind of, um, you know, as a signal to, um, that the webinar will be ending. This is uh, being recorded, so you will have um, access to this um, on the IACAC website. Um, and then the, um, the panelists will also be able to get uh, kind of like that list of all the students who were um, participating um, on the webinar as well. Um, you students, um, your camera and your microphones um, should be off. You guys are muted. Make sure to use that Q&A box um, and your panelists will be um, looking at those and monitoring that. Um, other than that, we'll go ahead and have them take it away. Um, you guys have a good webinar. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Paul Cuban. I'm the chair of the engineering department. Uh, thanks for sharing this time uh, today. Um, my, my goal here is to give a brief presentation on uh, the engineering department and then open it up to any questions you may have, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen with you so that I can uh, you can see some of these slides and the, uh, the picture that you see there is our, our business and engineering center. Um, now uh, a little more on that later, but uh, our engineering faculty and staff, we've got about 22 faculty members. Uh, two of those are full-time administrators, our Dean, is, uh, is in the engineering department, as is our director of our Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. I always got to think a few minutes what CEDL means. And I'm half-time admin because I'm chair, so I do a lot of admin duties, but I also still teach classes. Generally, we hire two, anywhere from two to six adjunct faculty. The adjuncts are um, that's a fancy name for our part-time faculty. They're people that, that work other jobs and they may come in and teach a night class or something for us. We have a lab technician, a lab director. Um, we're actually short our senior administrative assistant right now. She retired and we're, we're looking for someone at, at the time, at the moment. And we hire uh, quite a few student workers as well throughout the, the course of a semester. Our, our department operates out of two large buildings. Our, our bigger one is the Business and Engineering Center. And uh, that has a total of 120,000 square feet, which we split that half and half with the College of Business. So we get about 60,000 square feet. And that includes our classes and laboratory space. Some of our labs uh, include our electrical power and machines laboratory our electrical circuits lab, digital systems lab, uh, fluid mechanics lab, materials testing where we like to break things. Uh, we've got a lab for optics experiments, vibrations, um, environmental, soils. Um, two, two of the items in here are areas that are dedicated to student use. Uh, they're two of the rooms I really like to show off when we have students come and visit. Our, our design center is kind of a really fancy lounge uh, where our engineering students can hang out and work on their projects and, and um, work on their reports, et cetera. And our build center is where they can actually do cutting and soldering and whatnot. And a lot of our robotics type activity goes on in the build center. Uh, Within these labs, we have a multitude of state-of-the-art modern equipment. One of the items we've recently acquired is a micro CT scanner, a very expensive piece of machinery where we can look at the micro level at things like, well, or things like grains of sand or um, butterfly wings, petals of flowers, things like that. Uh, 
primarily used for the research from some of our faculty that are researching some of those items. We also have some, some new modern electrical trainers with um, pretty much any type of motor, transformer, et cetera, that, you, that one would use in an electrical class. Our universal testers are the machines where we break stuff. We, we put in test samples and uh, we break things and see how much force was required for something to break. We also use those, uh, again, I'll probably say pre-COVID a lot, but pre-COVID we had uh, a middle school program where we'd have the students come in and build a bridge like out of balsa wood or popsicle sticks or something like that. And then we can put them on our universal tester and, and break them and see how much load they were able to handle. Uh, so lots of labs there in the business and engineering center, but we also have our applied engineering center. Now this is a 16,000 square foot building, which is pretty much like a factory. Most of the space is just open and uh, contains a lot of our, our advanced manufacturing equipment. Although we do have two classrooms slash labs. Uh, that's where some of our automation and instrumentation equipment exists. Um, in the large factory, it's topped with a 10 ton crane. So that's kind of, a, kind of handy to move things around when we need to. But within that space, we have lots of computer operated mills and lathes. We've got an injection molding machine. We have a robotic welder as well as uh, several MIG welders. Uh, we have quite a few 3D scanners and printers. Um, we have three very professional commercial grade 3D printers, and we've just uh, bought a bunch of the little hobbyist kind, which believe it or not work almost just as well um, for about a hundredth of the price. Um, so, but the 3D printing gets a lot of use. Our water jet cutter is, uh, you might imagine like a, a giant above ground swimming pool, kind of rectangular shaped but it's got a, a water jet head on it that cuts things out of metal, styrofoam, et cetera. And it is one of our most popular tools. We have the second largest one. Well, there's only three that I know of in the Evansville area. Um, Evansville Sheet Metal has one like ours. And the only bigger one is at BWXT where they're making gigantic things for nuclear subs. Uh, we also have your standard shop tools as well, like uh, like drill press and grinders and things like that. Uh, within that Applied Engineering Center, we like to host our Engineering 108 classes, which is our freshman kind of team design, team experience course. We also have several student clubs, which again, I'll talk about a little bit more student clubs that build designs. And we also have our senior capstone project where students are, are generally building things and they all get to make use of this equipment as well as our lab technician that is a, uh, an experienced master machinist and he's there to help the, the students do their builds. So this is a picture of the inside of our applied engineering center. So we've got several, uh, work areas here for our students, um, as well as all of the equipment layout. And something I didn't mention about this facility, we have a printed circuit board manufacturing facility in here as well, where our students can design electronic printed circuits. We've recently made a very significant upgrade uh, by uh, acquiring a laser uh, circuit board burner, which is uh, has cut our time into about uh, a tenth of what it used to be on our mechanical uh, cutter. And here's a picture of some students uh, engaged with the, the PLCs. If you don't know what a PLC is, it stands for Programmable Logic Controller. And it's essentially a very robust computer that's used in factory automation systems. So it's not like a desktop computer that's gonna crash all the time. Uh, these are made to, to stay working and they're made primarily to process 
inputs from sensors and then output data for actuators. And they're housed in these little um, kind of factory type boxes. Now we also have uh, the ones, the one that she's looking at here is a very professional PLC, uh, which would run in the neighborhood of about $10,000. We also have some sets of kind of economy PLCs that we start the students out on, which are much less expensive. And in fact, they're so much less expensive, we're actually letting the students borrow the kits so they can do their labs at home uh, during the pandemic stuff. With regard to our programs, we actually have seven bachelor's degree programs now in the engineering department. We've got our, our flagship degree, which is the BS in engineering, which began in 2002 and has been through now three successful ABET accreditation reviews. We have our mechanical engineering degree and our manufacturing engineering degree, which began in fall of 2016. Those are also both accredited through ABET as of now. And our, our two newer degrees, electrical engineering and civil engineering, electrical was launched in 2018, civil was launched in 2019, and we are doing the ABET reviews for those uh, right now. The, uh, the planning process uh, is going on, and we would normally, <coughs> excuse me, we would normally have the review visit for those in October, but again, due to COVID-19, they've been converted to virtual visits and they will happen in January. And we will know by August of 21, uh, whether or not we've passed those ABED accreditation reviews. I do have full confidence that we will because these three we just did in the past two years and, and we passed those with, uh, with flying colors. Now, the two programs on the bottom fall under the tech category rather than engineering. So these are there for students who are not really interested in doing really super difficult math like you have in engineering programs, but they also allow students to get a lot of hands-on work with the technology that we have available. So one of those is industrial supervision and the other one is manufacturing engineering technology. Um, they're both geared toward preparing students for careers in manufacturing as supervisors, where the, the industrial supervision has more of a business side to it, and the manufacturing engineering technology has more of a technology side to it. Um, some of the things we uh, like to brag about here, our student to faculty ratio is about 20 to one. Uh, as you saw, we've got 22 or so faculty, and we've got about 500 students, uh, 460 to be exact, as of the fall census. Our typical class size is 24. In fact, our largest engineering classroom can only sit 24. So any kind of engineering, physics, or math course, it's going to be 24 or less. Um, now, you students might still be in a really large class, like for something like, oh, U.S. history. They might cram 100 people into a, into a room or something. But the, the technical classes are all going to be around 24. And the class size gets smaller as the students get into junior and senior year and break into their uh, discipline-specific areas. Our students are encouraged strongly to participate in the classes. And, you know, one of the, one of the comments we always get and we're always happy about is how enthusiastic and accessible our faculty are to our students, um, you know, providing individual help. And that's been probably one of the saddest things for us with regard to the pandemic is that you know, we don't get a chance to meet with our students as often as, as we used to. And when we do meet with them, dang it, it's got to be on Zoom instead of face to face. But hopefully we'll get past that soon. Um, 
All of our classes and labs are taught by professors. And most of our professors have industrial real world experience. Uh, we've got professors that, uh, two professors that have worked for NASA. We've got professors that have worked for Vectrin and Duke Energy. Uh, myself, I've worked for a uh, Texaco refinery and for Motorola in the early days of cell phone development. And that's where I gained a lot of my experience and, and several patents as well. Um, you know, most of our curriculum, it's a combination of theory, hands-on labs and design experiences. As I mentioned before, we have at least three um, design experiences built into all of the curriculum, but then within the individual courses, there are addis additional design projects as well. We do have a very robust co-op and internship program. We have over a hundred different companies that we uh, coordinate with to make this work. Most of the students do co-op during the summer, but some of them can also do it in the fall or the spring. The students will earn one credit hour in engineering elective or tech, tech elective for taking that course. They can do it up to three times. Actually, they can do it as many times as they want, but only three times will count for credit. And uh, it's really a great deal. The, the, the minimum pay is 15 bucks an hour, but some of our employers pay even more than that. And some of our employers even offer a scholarship to go along with the co-op. So it's a really good deal in terms of uh, earning some money and then also having something really good to put on your resume. So, you know, you kind of get a leg up when it's time to go out and look for a job and you can say that you, you know, you worked three months at Sabic or Barry Global, et cetera. An area where we really encourage our students to participate is with our student clubs. We have quite a lot of student clubs and these are, typically groups of five to 10 students and they're in like a nationally sanctioned organization. And there is some type of a design competition where the students have to, to do a team project. They design it, they build it, and then they compete with other colleges. And so some examples here, the American Society of Civil Engineers, they do a concrete canoe and a steel bridge the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers always does a, an autonomous robot. Um, our Mechanical Engineering Society, they do what's called a human powered vehicle, which is kind of like a recumbent bike. But they also um, volunteer their time to put on a Lego robotics contest for middle school students in the area. Our Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, they do what's called a mini Baja car. It's an all-terrain vehicle. The Society of Women Engineers, uh, they don't really do a project, but they have a conference that they attend every year. And we have had now at least three of our female graduates obtain jobs through that conference. Um, Solar Splash is the team that I run, and we build an electrical-powered boat, and um, excuse me, a solar-powered boat, still electrical, but uh, it's ran entirely by solar energy. And Engineers in Action is one of our most recent clubs, and there we help build bridges in impoverished regions in the world, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, so here's some pictures of those student design clubs. We've got our solar splash team here with the boat in the background. This one on the lower right, that's our mini Baja car going over a big log. And I'll tell you those uh, tracks they make for the Baja team are really brutal. It's giant poles and holes and, and rocks and boulders. And if you can actually survive the four hour race, you're probably gonna be in the top 20 because usually about half the cars are knocked out of the race in the first 10 minutes because the students just don't build uh, for the kind of grueling um, track that they've got set up. Here's the human powered vehicle I mentioned. 
Um, and this is kind of just the frame of it. The, uh, the part that's missing here would be a fairing to go around and make it more streamlined so they can go fast. Up here is our <clears throat> one of our concrete canoes sitting on one of our steel bridges. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. The canoe has to be designed so that it's light enough to be competitive but strong enough to not break up in the water. And yes, they do float and they have to carry three people and they have like uh, a number of different types of races. Like they'll have a slalom, they'll have a, um, a sprint race, etc. The steel bridge competition, uh, the way that works, the bridge has to be designed in components that are no longer than three feet long. And it has to arrive at the competition totally disassembled. And then the student team has to build the bridge across a fake river. Like they'll set up like a blue, a blue area in a, a gymnasium or something. And if, if the judge sees you stepping in the river, then you get points deducted, et cetera. The idea is you, you have to build the bridge without, without stepping in the river. And we've done some real nice uh, competitions there. This is our IEEE team and their autonomous robot. If you're not sure of the meaning of that term, autonomous means it's pre-programmed to do a series of tasks after you press the go button. So this was a kind of a Star Wars theme and it had to do the uh, lightsaber fighting, rocket shooting, it did some code decoding among other things. And of course they have to move around and navigate through a preset course. We're very thrilled that our, our 2017 team won first place out in um, um, Charlotte, North Carolina. And that's our, our picture of our team right there. Our 2018 team should have won first place, but uh, we got disqualified in the finals because we had a little bolt come off and land on the track. And that, and, and that was uh, one of the rules you get disqualified for that. But we ended up taking fourth in 2018, even though we had more points than anyone else. And then 2019, of course, well, you all know what happened with 2019. Our students got halfway to the event and the governor closed down the state and they had to turn around and come back. So we're, we're hoping for 2020 to be uh, a little better. Actually, I think I got my years wrong there. 2020 already happened. It's 2021. We hope will be a little better. Um, this is our Lego robotics competition that our ASME team helps with the middle school kids. And here we have some students showing the kids how to do some coding up there on the board. Now, We've had some major projects of which uh, we're very, very proud. Uh, one of them is the CubeSat project. This was done through a grant from NASA. And we had uh, teams of anywhere from 10 to 12 students working over the course of two and a half years to create a small satellite. You can see it's right there. It's about the size of a loaf of bread. And um, they were just talking about this on one of one of my podcasts last night. Um, they had a, a person from MIT who had done this and she was kind of bragging about about it. And she mentioned uh, that anything you do for space costs 100 times what it costs for the same product on Earth. And that's because uh, because of two things. The components you use have to be certifiably reliable that they're not going to start a fire or burn up or something and wreck us, you know, the space station or the rocket that's launching them. And then also they have to with, withstand super high temperature extremes. And, and lastly, when this thing is flying around the earth orbiting, it's going about 25,000 miles an hour. So it's got to withstand a lot of, a lot of, uh, stuff that it wouldn't do on earth. So we also had to go through about a hundred different tests to make sure it was going to be safe to put on a SpaceX rocket. And so we actually were very successful and 
pardon me for bragging, but, you know, out of 30 college teams that began this effort, only three college teams were able to put their CubeSat on a SpaceX rocket and have it delivered to the space station, which you see here. Only three got them in there. And then when our when they were deployed, that, that means set out to orbit, only one of those satellites actually worked and still works to this day. And we're still collecting data from it and doing experiments with it. So we're very proud of that team. And uh, we've got a really good chance at getting another NASA grant to do another CubeSat coming up shortly. <clears throat> another project we are really, really uh, proud of is our Africa bridge build. And we do this through our engineers in action uh, um, student chapter. So what you're seeing here is the bridge that we built in Africa. And you see this little river down here just looks like a little old creek, not, not a real big deal. But what happens is you have schools, churches, stores, et cetera, on one side of the river. And on the other side of the river, you have uh, where people live, the residential areas. And nine months out of the year, it's fine. They can just walk right over this creek and get to where they need to go. But three months out of the year during the rainy season, this becomes a raging river that's 20 feet deep and strong currents. And the people try to cross it and they die. And the year that we built our bridge, they had 16 people die in this village already just in that one year. So what our goal is, is to create a pedestrian bridge so that during the rainy times, the people can walk across the bridge and get safely to where they need to go. So this was done as a joint effort with Cornell. Since we were a, a beginning school, this was the first year we did it. And, you know, of course, we were all set up to do it again and had to cancel because of COVID. And we're, we're hoping we can do one this summer, but it's not really looking good because um, in terms of the hot spots, Africa is still one of the one of the red do not travel there uh, kind of places. So, so it's probably going to be um, summer of 22 when we actually bring this back up. At least we hope, we hope that happens. But um, that's kind of an overview of our uh, engineering program and some of the things we do. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about that and oh it looks like let me unmute everybody because everybody's muted oh i don't have the i do not have the power um i guess you've got to ask a question in the q a button down at the bottom of your screen there's a q a button if you have any questions feel free Paul, I don't think we have any attendees. Everyone you're looking well, who at. Are all these, who are all these people? We're your colleagues, Paul. <laughs> and you well, have now you know all about us. Mm -hmm. And it's recorded, so, so they can yes. look at it, yes. uh, you know, yes. later on. <laughs> it was a good, good presentation. It was really good. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. I've only done it about 8,000 times now, so I, I ought to be getting better at it. Uh, I, I can say I'm really proud of our program and our facilities. And um, it's, it's very fortunate, the support we get from the state uh, and the university with regard to our uh, equipment and facilities. I'll, I'll leave it at that, but okay. Well, thank you all for joining in. And uh, I don't know that there's any need to hang out if, if there's nobody else watching. So if I have the power, I'll go ahead and leave the meeting, but thank you very much. Good to see you all. Have a good day. Thanks. Take care.
Bye, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Should we, should we leave or is there any possibility that someone will come in? I don't know, moderator? Oh, Everyone's gone now except you and me. Set, so I just have that share screen, um, but you guys are all set. Right, I asked, we asked if anyone might enter. We don't have any attendees, nor have we for the last 30 minutes. And we asked yeah, if anyone so you might will get the, um, you will, uh, like of everyone who registered. So you will get, um, you will get that email to you. Um, and then this, um, the recording is up. So it is available for um, you guys to use um, and share um, when it is, uh, when it becomes available. So they'll be on the IACAC website. Well, other than that, yeah, um, if you guys, I mean, you guys still have uh, 15 minutes. Right, um, and we were asking if it's possible students might pop in or? Um, it is possible. Um, so if you, I mean, yeah, cause I'm still staying on until the 4.15. Um, so if you guys wanna <laughs> um, just be on mute and hang out with me, um, you are more than welcome. Okay. Thanks.